Hello friends. My name is Joy Bovin and I work at Bates Nursery Garden Center. This is Bates Nursery Botanical Boot Camp. Today our topic is For the Birds. Uh, we will discuss intentional design and plant material that will better support our little feathered friends that we love so much and who are very a very necessary part of our ecosystem. And I would like to also say from the beginning that though this topic is on birds, I will occasionally stray to other critters too, because a landscape that caters to the whole is the end goal. Birds require food, shelter, and water. We will touch on all of these needs during this, this discussion. Creating a desirable habitat where all of these needs can be met is the intention. And it starts with transforming your landscape to model nature's design. Our native woodlands naturally create four layers. We've got the canopy layer, understory layer, the shrub layer, and the ground layer. Um, the bird community is very complex and diverse. Some scavenge on the forest floor for worms and insects. Some like to perch in the highest reaches of the canopy layer, and others prefer to dance around in the understory and the shrub layers of the woodland forest. Creating these dimensions in your landscape supports a large scope of bird species. So first off, the canopy layer. This would be any of your hardwood trees. Um, I kind of categorize it as anything that will get 50 feet or taller. Uh, it's also the hardest layer to create, of course, um, because you've got to wait for things to grow. Um, when you plant a six foot tree, it's going to take a minute before it gets to 50 feet. Um, if you already have mature trees, you're a step ahead of the game. So I want to discuss a few canopy trees that I would personally recommend and that are great for um, not only the birds, but also insect life and um, other uh, they would be also host plants for um, caterpillars and moths. First off, we've got maples. There are two types of maples. Sorry for that phone call. Uh, it wasn't for me. Um, we've got the red maple and sugar maple. Those are the two most common native maples that we have here. Um, there are several cultivars that you can choose from that we have here at Bates. Um, we've also got river birch, which is a really popular tree right now. Uh, what I would say about the river birch is make sure that you plant it uh, far away from your house because it, it's, and also for the maples as well, they have an extensive root system and you want to give them plenty of space to grow. We've also got hickory, which is one of my favorites for sure. Difficult to find. Um, the, main, the main two hickories that we have um, is tomentosa, which is the mockernut, and we've also got Oveda, which is shagbark hickory, which is probably my favorite tree, period. Um, they produce nuts for not only the squirrels, but also white-tailed deer, raccoons, uh, which is the raccoon is the Tennessee state animal, if you didn't know that. Um, moving on to the next is the catalpa, or southern Indian bean. Um, it does come with a worm that's kind of a, a pest. Uh, but overall, it is a great tree for our area. We've got the American beech, or Fagus grandif grandiflora. That can also be an understory tree. Uh, when you see it growing out in our woodland spaces, you see a lot of beech um, in, underneath larger oaks. So that's another one to choose. You've got the tulip poplar, which is the state tree of Tennessee. Um, grows relatively quickly. So with that, consider that a tree that grows quicker than others often means that the bark or the, it's a little less strong. Uh, so another one to not plant right next to your house. Uh, we've got black gum that is also referred to as tupelo. Um, that is, it's going to get about 50 feet, not as tall as some of oaks or other things other trees, it's got great fall color. The most common cultivar is called wildflower, and that's the one we sell here at Bates. We have the sycamore, the native sycamore, which is occidentalis, is the uh, species. Uh, many birds are attracted to the seeds produced by this tree. It is also a favorite for cavity nesters, such as the barred owl, which barred owl is a bird. 
It's also a predator to little baby birds, so but it's just a part of the ecosystem as well. So it's nice to have something that they like too. Uh, and then oaks. That's it. oak. The Quercus is, genus is a big family. Um, it's broken up into upland and bottomland oaks. So in the upland category, which just means it's usually found more on like the um, higher elevations, a little more drought tolerant, rocky soil. That would be alba or white oak, which gets ginormous. The scarlet oak is another one. Great fall color and also rubra. All three of those are in the upland oak category. Bottomland oaks include the swamp white oak, which is bicolor, overcup oak, lyrata, macrocarpa, which is the bur oak, uh, nuttail oak or natalii, and fellows or willow oak. Willow oak will also, all of these will get pretty big, but we have a specimen on the Bates property of a willow oak and it is marvelous. So oaks in particular, they're a great food source uh, for squirrels and deer and raccoons. Also the oaks are the best tree to consider when you want to incorporate um, a host tree because oaks uh, support a large array of insect life, moths, butterflies, um, so it's just got so many purposes. If you have the space for an oak, I encourage you to choose one. Um, and based on the fall color that you like or how tall they get, they're a great addition to your canopy landscape. We've also got sassafras, which is very, very difficult to find, but one of my favorite trees as well. And then the basswood, which is, is somewhat uncommon, but it's, actually, it's quite common in our, our woodland areas. Uh, it's also Tilia americana is the scientific name. Um, if you are limited in space and can only choose one or two trees to add to your landscape, my top picks would be oak, hickory, sassafras, and tulip poplar. Um, so with that said, we're going to go to the understory layer. These are um, trees that typically get about 15, 20 feet, sometimes taller. Um, but in an understory situation with dappled light, not exposed to full sun, they're not going to reach their full potential necessarily. Um, some more than others, but like, say, for, uh, for example, maybe a dogwood. Um, in a complete understory situation, they won't reach 30, 40 feet. If, if they do, it's going to take a very long time. So first off in the understory tree category is Aeschylus pavia, or red buckeye. Um, flowers in the spring are great for pollinators, and the seeds that develop later in the season are great for squirrels. Uh, next is service berry. There are many different kinds of service berry, most common being autumn brilliance. My, my personal favorite is one called rainbow pillar. These are a food so source for birds in the summer months, but also a great understory tree, and the fall color is spectacular. A simina trilova, or pawpaw. This is a very popular tree right now, and for good reason. Um, you see it everywhere. If you go hiking in our um, parks nearby, you'll see it if you can spot it. Uh, if you are interested in the pawpaw, it is important to have several. One standalone pawpaw will not produce any fruit. You must create a grove of them, and that's how you find them naturally, just several. It's, a, it's literally a grove. So I would not recommend this understory tree if, you have, if you're limited in space. Next, we have the eastern redbud, Cercis canadensis. Certainly Tennessee's staple flowering tree. When these start blooming, we are reminded that spring is just around the corner. Seed pods are desired both by a variety of birds and squirrels. Also something to note, because they bloom so early, they are an important source of nectar for some of our um, pollinating insects. Uh, next we've got the American fringe tree or Cyananthus virginicus. This is um, not a very common spotted tree out in the woodland situation, but it does exist within the eastern um, United States forests. It is spectacular when it blooms in the spring. It's just kind of this fluffy, fringy, white bloom. Um, if you got the space for that, I definitely would add it to your understory layer. And flowering dogwood, which we have. This is Cornus, Florida, Cherokee Princess. Um, and if you have driven around town any time lately, you will notice that the dog, this is the dogwood year for fall color. It is fantastic. Um, and this is 
just a perfect example of how great their fall color can look. Um, that is also a source for birds in the fall because um, they produce seeds. And it's a, it's a favorite for several of our bird species. We Next is the hawthorn, Crataegus. Uh, two main, main type or kinds of hawthorn that we carry here at Bates would be the winter hawthorn, um, cultivar being winter king, and then the Washington hawthorn. Uh, the winter king will get bigger than the Washington hawthorn. Both have thorns, hence thorn. Um, but it's a, it's a favorite for perching for a lot of birds because the, um, in between the, the branching, there's a lot of space for birds to sit and perch and probably offers some protection. Um, we have the American persimmon. That is a great tree, great fall color, tends to drop a little bit earlier in some of the other trees as far as the leaves in the fall. Uh, the fruit is messy and gross, but the squirrels love it. Um, and you can actually, you personally can eat it if you can reach the fruit and you have to wait until they're ripe and kind of almost mushy. Uh, next we've got the Magnolia macrophylla or big leaf magnolia. That's a great understory tree as well. It will get 40, 50 feet eventually, but it's going to take a lot of time um, and does just fine in an understory situation. Uh, we have red mulberry. Definitely more of a summer fruit for the birds, uh, but a great perching tree. Um, and like we said before, you know, yes, we're talking about fall and winter food sources, but having it, it also serves as that understory tree for birds year round. Um, and then as a food source in the summer. Uh, lastly, in the understory category would be Carolina buckthorn. Not a very common, commonly sold tree. It gets about 20 to 25 feet or 15 to 25, depending on its, its, where it's uh, situated. Produces berries late into the summer, into fall. Great fall color and an excellent, um, it also is a host plant for the caterpillar, I can't remember, um, but a great addition to your understory as well. <laughs> understory tree specifically, um, specific food sources for birds in the fall. There's three main ones that we've talked about. It's the hawthorn, Carolina buckthorn, and flowering dogwood. All right, now we are at the shrub layer. This is where a lot of the berry source is for, for birds in the fall. First off, we've got the bottle brush buckeye. This is not a food source for birds in the fall, but it, it makes a great um, shrub layer. It gets really big and impressive. The blooms in the spring are awesome. Um, and it kind of is this dense habitat for a lot of bird species. Uh, we've got the aronia, choke cherry. Brought one in for, to show you today. That's this thing that's in the way. Um, there are two main types of aronia. There's um, melanocarpa, which is black choke cherry, which is what this one is. And there is red choke cherry, which is arbutifolia. This one, Viking, you can eat the berries of the chokeberry. Um, they are extremely tart, and most people, when they use them in a medicinal or edible situation, will um, not, it's not a fresh fruit. It's a, you boil it, you process it, add other things to it, so it's not quite so tart. I can't speak a lot on that. I've never um, tasted chokeberry. Uh, I grow it for the birds because they love it as well. Um, Calcarpa Americana, American Beauty Berry, uh, one of my favorite shrubs. It is, its seeds develop late into the fall, and when um, they defoliate, you are left with these lovely arching branches covered in light purple berries. Um, specifically, uh, a coworker was telling me the other day that he, he's got a mockingbird in his, um, in his yard that just goes to town on those berries. Which, if you didn't know, the mockingbird is the state bird of Tennessee. Clethra, or summer sweet. There are many cultivars to, cultivars to choose from in this category. Seeds ripen in the fall and is a great small seed for the songbirds. Euonymus americanus, or hearts of busting. Um, this is a unique little native shrub that grows in our local woodlands. Seeds ripen in the fall and is a favorite treat for the bird that discovers them. 
Next, we have Ilix verticillata or winterberry holly. Fruit on the winterberry holly stays on long after the leaves drop in the fall, adding not only food for the birds, but a wonderful sight to enjoy in your home landscape. This is a plant that has separate male and female plants. And within this species, some cultivars pair better with some than others. So make sure that you do a little extra research to make sure that you get the right pair. Um, we have brought in, this is a winterberry holly. It has already set, I mean, it's set with berries, has dropped its leaves. This particular one is winter red. And in this situation, it pairs best with Southern Gentleman. So that's something to note. Itea virginica. And I meant to bring one in for you because they look really great on the lot and I forgot. Virginia sweet spire is its common name. Seeds ripen in the fall and a great small seed choice for songbirds. Sambucus canadensis or American elderberry. Uh, fruit typically develops in late summer, early fall, and is an excellent food source for birds. It also has medicinal and edible um, components as well for you. If you can, uh, if you want to use them for that purpose, you should have a lot of them. The good news is, is that Sambucus, if you find it, is easy to propagate. So if you're wanting a, a large stand of it, uh, with a little patience, you'll you'll get there. Because um, it is, it's it's gaining in popularity, but still not a whole lot of people grow it, and hopefully that will change soon. Last on the list is viburnum. Um, there are lots of native viburnums. I'm just going to focus on two. We've got arrowwood viburnum or dentatum. Um, the two main uh, cultivars for this topic would, or this um, species would be blue muffin and Chicago luster. Uh, this is the next one, nudum or possum haw viburnum. Brandywine is this cultivar. And the other one is winter thur. Uh, I, I mentioned both or two because you need you need to have several for ultimate um, pollination and berry production. So planting just one isn't really going to do much for you as far as producing berries. So keep that in mind. All right, now we have gotten to the ground layer, which is right here. Uh, not too many woodland perennials offer much for the birds this time of year, but there are a few to mention. There are plenty of lovely perennials to plant for other seasons, but at the risk of going over time, I will save for a later date in a different discussion. Um, brought in two for you. Excellent specimens. Look great this time of year. <laughs> this is Vernonia. Um, I've brought this in for other webinars and it looks completely different, but this is the time where it's setting its seeds. So again, it's important to note Wait to cut back your flowering perennials because things like Veronia, Vernonia, um, Eupatorium, Echinacea are a food source for um, a lot of bird species. And so the other one that I brought in is another looker. Looks great this time of year. This is Solidago, Goldenrod. Another produces a lot of seeds for the birds, so make sure you're leaving that up too. Um, panicum is a native grass that we have. That's great for the for birds as well. I've got it shoved back here. Um, and it's it starts. It, this is its prime time to start feeding the birds. The seeds are ripe. The, some of them have already fallen off. They're really small. Um, really great source for birds. Okay, so at the beginning we talked about shelter, water, food. Now we're gonna talk about shelter, because that's important too. Evergreen trees and shrubs are also a vital part of the landscape for birds. Um, they offer shelter from storms and high winds, as well as potential nesting opportunities. We have uh, Capressus arizonica, not native to our region, but a really great evergreen option when you're trying to create a screen on your property or, or whatnot, um, that would be one of my first choices. And it's also a great habitat for birds um, and fulfills those needs for shelter. We've got American holly, uh, Elix opaca. This is not necessarily, when you look at the map of the USDA, um, it's not specific to the basin of Nashville, but you'll see it start popping up as you go west on 40. It's really, you'll see it on the side of the road as you're driving towards Memphis. Um, Satter Hill is a common cultivar found in the trade. Uh, if you can find it, this is such a great holly and food source for the birds and also offers that additional shelter. Um, 
in any other, uh, Holly is a good choice. I, my first would pick would be the Opaca, but you can also, um, Red Beauty is a really adorable Holly that doesn't get quite as big as some of the others, but still offers that shelter and, and food source. Or you could go something like Nellie R. Stevens. Um, Liberty is another great Holly. Um, lots of, of evergreen Hollies to choose from to add to your landscape. Next, we have the Eastern Red Cedar or Juniperus virginiana. Um, this is certainly a native, it's everywhere, everywhere. Um, but the one thing to note if, I, I wanna promote this tree, but I also know we, we struggle with something called fire blight or cedar apple rust, and it affects a lot of some of the other natives. Um, service berry, it affects that. Um, if you've got an apple orchard, that certainly is an issue. The malice family, so. Um, if you if you have cedars in your yard already, keep that in mind as you're planting some of the more susceptible. Hawthorn is also a bit susceptible to the cedar apple rust, um, but still a lovely, lovely evergreen and a great addition to our area. Next is the Magnolia grandiflora or the Southern Magnolia. Very, very, very common, but also though it's common, it's great for the birds as well because it offers that shelter. Picea abies or Norway spruce, not a native, um, but not aggressive, not an issue, and a marvelous evergreen tree for your yard and offers that shelter. And lastly, we've got American hemlock, um, great food source for the birds because uh, it's this little, little seed in the cone, a great source of shelter, a nesting site for barred owls as well um, and other bird species. So that ends um, the layers of, of a woodland forest and, and what we want to achieve in our own landscape because as you know, we have taken out so much of the tree canopy um, and, and we should all try to do our part to try to add some of that back. Um, some common fall and winter birds for our region. You probably know a handful. If you're watching this, you're probably already bird nerd. So I'm, I'm, I know that already, but maybe you don't know some of the plants um, that you can add to your landscape. But just to touch on a few of the birds that we have, we've got the blue jay, kind of a bully, cardinal. Um, you seem to notice the cardinals the most when there's snow on the ground because they just pop out and are absolutely gorgeous. We've got chickadees and wrens, those little birds um, that hop around on the ground. Dark-eyed junco, eastern bluebird, house finch, mockingbird, tufted titmouse, um, sparrows and lots of lots of different woodpeckers, northern flicker, downy woodpecker, red-bellied woodpecker, and pileated. Um, I'm not going to go too in depth with bird species because I'm still a baby on learning about birds. I know a lot about the plants that they like, um, but I look forward to the next couple of months. I've ordered three three books on Amazon um, to expand my knowledge on on bird species. Uh, additional needs for birds would be water sources. Um, it's, it's easy to forget about your bird bath this time of year because it's not hot um, and you're not dragging your hose all around <laughs> and hitting your bird, bird bath while you're watering your plants, but it is a very important time to keep that filled for them. Um, in my yard, the robins are going nuts. I, on Sunday, I filled my bird bath up twice because they're just having a heyday. Um, and they're really cute when they, they drink from the bird bath because they'll, they'll take a sip and just kind of sit there and absorb it. Um, so, so keep that in mind. And even it becomes even more difficult as we get into winter and it freezes. There's things on the Internet you can buy that heat up the water. Haven't gone that far yet. Um, but really, honestly, most of the time we don't get that cold. So we're a little lucky in Tennessee that, that, that we're not that cold in the winters. Another thing to note is to leave your leaves. Leaving leaf litter both encourages earthworm and insect activity and offers the food source for ground feeding birds such as the robin. Each year I mulch my leaves up in the lawn and blow them into the beds. And by spring, they are um, decomposed, pulled into the earth. I don't, I'm, then I am free to do mulch if I have the time to do that. Uh, don't use pesticides, just don't. Uh, we desperately need our insect populations, and those creatures support the big picture for us and our feathered friends. Uh, add some birdhouses. I also don't have much to add on this topic because I don't have any birdhouses yet, but I look forward to building them and having them. 
Um, but it is a, a you could get, go down the rabbit hole of the size of the hole that birds prefer and the type of house that they like. There's just lots to learn about bird houses. Um, I encourage you to join me in that journey of learning more about that because um, it's a great, great thing to add to your landscape and to your bird sanctuary. Feeders. Diversity within feeders. Try having one with sunflower hearts and another that is a mix of millet and other seed types. Also look into having a suet feeder. These are a favorite for our woodpeckers um, who visit all throughout the winter months. Um, a good source to get bird seed is um, your local co-op should have some and bird feeders as well. We have odds and ends stuff for birds, but we don't supply heavily um, for the bird seed and that whatnot because it kind of requires a facility that we don't have the ca capacity to have, which is keeps all the varmints away from, from it. Or we could just get 10 cats. Um, when designing a bird, friendly landscape, food source, diversity is number one on the list. Planting a lot of one thing does little for our ecosystem and our bird species. Explore your options and plant as much variety as you can. Also, don't be discouraged if you have a small plot of land. Even with the little, <clears throat> of, uh, even the little affects the whole, and that little matters too. Perhaps consider getting together with your neighbors and creating a plan together of material that you can coordinate. They may think you are a crazy bird person, but if you do, if they do, you should wear that like a badge of honor. So that sums up my talk of birds. Um, do we have any questions? Okay, we can wait. Also didn't mention this oak over here. Um, that's Shumardi Eye Oak, showing off its fall color right now. Didn't even mention that one, but that's a good one, too. Uh, we have a message that's, uh, what were the four top layers? Yeah, I said oak, hickory, sassafras, and tulip poplar. <laughs> but sassafras is hard to find, unfortunately. It's hard to grow. Anything good to say about hackberry? Oh, yes, it's not their fault. Um, because of the woolly aphid, it, they, it's just, it's a nuisance. They are a nuisance. Um, they drop all that sooty mold on everything that cakes your patio furniture and your evergreen things in the yard. I'm speaking from experience because I have a lot of hackberries. Um, I don't know. Uh, definitely don't treat them. That, that might make you feel better, but that is terrible for all the other insect life. Um, honestly, my plan is to slowly take those out and plant trees in their place. But it's not their fault. And I missed a question from Lynn. Is there a handout with the names of the plants spelled correctly? Uh, we will take care of that after this. Um, usually, uh, we post a, a list of things that were talked about on our website attached to um, the video. Do you have anything to add to that as far as your end of things of what you guys do? Yeah, so if you go to BatesNursery.com uh, and click on blog at the top of the website, you'll see the uh, Botanical Boot Camp webinar archived. And that's where this webinar and all the other ones that we've done uh, through this past summer are. And those, each one of those will have uh, lists as well as links to species on the Bates Nursery website. So you can check them out and, uh, and what we have in stock. Uh, this will also be archived on YouTube, uh, so you'll be able to pull up the entire webinar again and the source document. Well said. <laughs> um, that, and that's important because we, we already have several videos on our YouTube channel, um, and if you're just watching it on YouTube, you don't know that resource to, to go back and, and kind of see all that other stuff that went along with the actual webinar. Uh, I have questions about compost and leaves, but we'll just come out there to ask in person. You got any okay. quick advice? Um, some leaves are harder to compost than others. If you've got sycamore or oak, uh, it might be worth it to get a, a simple or a intense, legit leaf mulcher to aid in that process. Um, but if you've got, you know, simple, simple smaller leaves, it's just easy to just blow them in. Um, because the, the worms will take care of it. Okay, and 
Do some berries have a better lipid profile for migraines? Um, yes, they do. Um, I didn't go too far into that. Like, uh, that is still something that I need to learn a lot about. Um, I wanted to stick to the basics this time, and then, you know, next time after I've read about 10 more books, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, there is. And it starts with natives, for sure. You know, we've, we've planted pri privets everywhere now, and that's such a bad food source for birds as they're trying to migrate. Um, it's actually a, a huge problem. Okay, uh, that looks like everything. Okay. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I hope that you can take something away from this. Come visit us, um, plant more things for the birds because it's just a, it's a really important topic and it's, it's getting to where we really have to do something about this um, because things aren't getting any better. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you guys have a wonderful day.